And we are live. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Fix family, wherever you are in the world. Um, today we have an absolutely fantastic webinar in partnership with Dynamic Tape on the evolution um, of the concept of movement health and its relationship to the topic of movement variability. And we're joined by experts Lincoln Blanford and Beate Stitt who are presenting. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks, Megan. Um, absolutely. So thanks, Megan. So Yes, so we're so excited. Um, Lincoln is the Head of Research, Education and Development at Camara Movement Science. And he's not only helped design, develop and deliver the education, but also the fundamental concepts that support kinetic control, um, the performance matrix and the movement science practitioner series. And Beate is kinetic control accredited tutor and clinician who works with Dynamic Tape. And she's committed to helping clinicians from all over the world see movement and its potential through the lens of kinetic control. Um, and she has really unique insight into patients with running related injuries and issues. So for indeed for her movement is the solution. Um, and she states that her pet hate at, is hearing that patients have been told to stop running because it's bad for their backs and knees. Is that, have I got that right, Beate? Sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> okay, perfect. So the session today um, is supported by an exploration of the scientific literature that they've both produced to this effect alongside how these concepts are practically applied within the clinical and performance environments. Um, and without further ado, everybody's joined in and logged in today to hear from Lincoln and Beate. So um, I will hand over the floor and um, hand it over to you. I believe we've got some excellent slides here today that I'll pull up now and then I will jump off. Thanks, Fantastic. Megan. Thanks so much. So thank you for that, that, lo that loft of introduction. I just want to add sort of into that um, in terms of the development of this content. A lot of this come from the, the work of... Uh, uh, Mark Comerford and, and Sarah Mottram in terms of the development of the KC and also some of the ideas around um, uh, certainly movement health and uh, also performance matrix. So good to get that in early doors. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to presenting this content. As we see okay. movement health, movement verbality as our sort of uh, topic, possessing choice in action and both myself and Beata presenting this. I'm coming in from a, I guess, somebody who is... Um, uh, developing the research um, alongside colleagues, whereas Beata coming in as the, the clinician develop, uh, delivering this day to day uh, with patients. So hopefully together we can sort of present a, an interesting, engaging uh, narrative around this particular topic. So commercial movement science and dynamic tape, we just need to explore the interaction between those two. Uh, movement health as a construct, as a concept, a bit of a sort of a backstory on that. And then verbiality, verbiality within movement, how people move differently uh, to themselves, to each other, what that means. And then some ideas also around dynamic tape um, as a product, as a, as a construct as well. This Lincoln? idea then, oh, sorry, is there a question? Sorry, sorry, Lincoln, um, we don't seem to be moving along the slides. Do you want to maybe change it to a slide for view? Yeah. Um, Hello, everybody. Here's me. <laughs> Sorry. Mate. Okay. So. so we'll just pull up the slides again. Thanks so much for everybody for joining us. Um, this will take another opportunity while we're pulling up the slides to remind you that you can leave comments throughout in the Facebook section. And then, Lincoln, would you like to, if you can put up um, full screen share, that might also bring it up a bit larger for us. So at the moment, um, the only options I've got is I can stop sharing. So within the actual presentation, um, yeah. can we hit present? Okay. All oh, right, so we're going to back up to present. We're going back into share screen. Thanks everyone for bearing with us. Technical, <laughs> always technical issues always keep it keep it entertaining and fun. Indeed, but if you are good. joining us, thanks for joining us. Um, this replay is also going to be available permanently online on the Facebook page and on the Fix website as well um, on the Dynamic Tape sponsor page. Um, I will keep back over to you, Lincoln. Okay, Megan, hopefully you can see the, uh, the, the title slide there again. Not yet. 
Um, and if you if you go into present mode, Lincoln, is it on present? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and and if you say like start slideshow. Yep. That's from the beginning. Any change yet? Because I can only see what we, I can see. We're seeing the title slide, um, but we're seeing Brilliant. all the slides on the side as well. So let's just see if you go to the next slide. Yeah, we've gone to the next slide. No, it hasn't changed. Okay. How about now? Nope. Unfortunately not. Okay. That's now the next slide. Perfect. Now we can see the next slide. Okay, but um, we're not in the uh, we're not in the slide, so that's any any problem there. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so what about now? At this stage, still in the in that original view. I don't know if there's just a delay. All right. Okay, now we're on the third slide. Okay. Um, so let's what just we, take it back. Uh, going back to present, to keep well, it simple. Yeah. What we can do as well, if we keep this view, um, where we're just continuing to move through the slides with the um, slides on the side, um, I'll also, I can grab the slides from you afterwards and then I can edit the um, replay version that goes up live on, that goes up onto our website so that the slides are um, full of screen. Okay. Okay. And maybe we can just reduce the ribbon at the top, Lincoln, um, just to see if it. Um, okay. Oh, so just how leave it as is. No, no, yeah, let's leave right. it as is. Yeah, let's go for it. So we can continue going for it and keep moving through as is. And then um, for anybody catching the replay, I'll make sure that these slides are um, larger on your screen. Um, but it is all, it is, um, we, we can see, we can see all of the content, so. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to think about how I can get through now to the next slide without without you changing, uh, without that changing. Okay. So if I go here, you've got a different yeah. slide, huh? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, well done. Awesome. All right. So this will be a little bit of an amended version of what we were going to get originally, but okay, we, we seem to have some sort of uh, idea around that. Where were we? Well, <laughs> We were having this outline of uh, Kimura Group, which involves uh, dynamic tape and Kimura science. So there's an interaction between these two components. Uh, one part is that we are Kimura Group, um, and we are a, a collection of companies, and we is a, have a collaboration with dynamic tape alongside that. Within the Kimura Group, there's Kimura science. And what we have here then is a, a collection of different brands of which sits uh, Connect Control, the Performance Matrix, and a number, number of other options. And we deliver training, education for primarily uh, uh, physical therapists, so physios around the world. And we have a, a global tutor team of which Beata is a member of that. So movement science, well, <laughs> we've got a lot of that. Um, so we, we have this title, Kimura Movement Science, but where is the science? And we can see dating back from the, um, the mid uh, 2000s, early 2000s, a collection of literature that's built this evidence base for what we do with this idea of something called movement health. Now, the idea with this is that we can look at how people move, we can assess movement, and this idea that we can change movement based on um, a, a rigorous assessment process, and that's going to then change their clinical outcomes, for example, for working with patients. But this also relates to uh, working within sporting environments, so performance as well. But here today, we're placing more focus on, on, a, on clinical outcomes. Okay. So what is movement health? How would we describe this particular construct? Let's start with this idea of of movement, why we place so much focus on movement. We see this uh, interaction between the task, the environment, and the individual. 
this is the um, these three domains. These three domains interact. So everything about the individual, the task performing, and the environment they're performing in come together. And through that interaction, movement emerges, let's say. We can see a movement pattern emerge from those interactions. The reason we place so much focus on movement is because movement is observable and also we believe modifiable, that we can change movement over time. So it's something that we can um, very easily observe, as in we don't need lots of technology maybe to do that, but also we believe we can change movement for better outcomes. Another reason we want to place focus on movement is because movement is an output that also becomes an input for the next interaction. So how we move now could work very well affect how we move next. And both in the short term and the long term. So acutely, we could be, um, if we think about sort of running, how we hit the floor may also then affect how we then leave the floor, take off. But longer term, how we move now could affect how we move uh, and later points in our life with respect to uh, musculoskeletal health. So that's the idea. If we can change movement now, we can send that change movement forward into the future for better outcomes. It's the idea we can test and change movement. Is then a question of which element of movement do we consider? So we're saying place this element, this focus on movement, but what component of movement? And depending where we're coming in from, this is going to change whether we're uh, an athletic trainer, whether we're a physio, whether we're a coach, and also with the actual client, the patient, the athlete. Are we going to place focus on um, uh, stride um, length? Are we going to place focus on uh, ground contact times? Are we going to look at the kinematics in terms of uh, joint angles, kinetics, force production? Are we looking at muscle activation? So there's lots of elements of movement we could then classify, assess, and try and change. So there's an element of perspective there. We turn into then the focus that is movement health. Here we're saying that movement health is spreading. The term I haven't heard maybe sort of, I don't know what we're in now, 2013, maybe sort of 10 years ago. Whereas now we're seeing this idea of movement health spreading across different areas. We've got... Um, We've got conferences, we've got businesses, we've got publications talking about this concept. Now, that's Amazon Halo movement paper. They do offer some more insight of what they mean about movement health. And we can see it's described here. It's fairly generic in terms of the descriptions of what movement health could be. All right. So what we get from those statements is it's quite broad. So I'm going to get a little bit more specific in where we're coming from in terms of movement health. We want to place focus on choice. This idea of movement health being a moving away from injury the risk of injury, but also building performance and also quality of life as we move more towards movement health. This is possessing choice in what and how we move. So what we do with our movement system, but also how we move during those actions. And loss of choice, loss of choice in both what we want to do and also how we can do it would equal compromised movement health within this particular model. And this is coming in from our sort of publications over the, again, the, the past sort of 10 years or so. Elements of choice in movement. Well, here we have that model once more. We've got those changing environments, changing tasks, and changes also occur with the individual. There's also changes with those interactions. The interaction between the individual and the environment is consistently, constantly changing. So having choice in how we move and what we do with it, it's going to allow us to accommodate this change in environment task and also the individual themselves. And when I see change in the individual, this could be due to the presence of something like fatigue. So as fatigue creeps in, movement's likely to change as we then try to sustain the task outcome again against the changing environment. So having choice, the ability to continue what we're doing, 
both at the what and the how, how we move, would be a representation of, of movement health within this model. So we can access those range of different movement choices available. So we can choose what tasks we do and how we do it. So selection and both execution. We then get into this topic called movement variability. So, okay, at this point, just to, just to remind, we are talking about movement in a broad, a very broad, um, um, as a very broad construct. We've identified that we can, we believe we can assess and change movement over time for better outcomes. We've introduced this construct called movement health. We then get into this idea of movement variability. So movement is variable. People move differently to themselves and also to one another. Now, when I mean they move different to one another, is if we do a comparison of kinematics, for example, there is a distinction between individuals. How they perform the same task, so-called same task, differs. There's also distinctions for the individual themselves. If they perform the same task again and again, it's different every time to some degree. Now, is this error? Is this error in the system? If we write the word sport multiple times, it will be different every time. So emerging from those interactions, the individual, the task environment, we've got movement that's different every time. And classically, traditionally, this has been considered as error as opposed to being the, the mean performance, which is identified as maybe uh, optimal. Perhaps though, that this distinction of how we move time to time permits problem solving. So in the, the changing interaction between the individual, the task, the environment, the fact we're seeing a different movement pattern or movement characteristic emerge every time maybe means that we're solving those particular problems presented to us by the changing constraints. Perhaps the distinction in movement every time is also is exploring, exploiting the different options available to us. So we're trying to find a solution to the challenge presented to us. And this also sits in with some of the work of Mark Latash with respect to motor abundance, the idea that considering that we're going to move the same way every time is, is not realistic, that maybe there isn't an optimal movement solution for anything, and maybe we just find good enough solutions to address the situation in front of us. With respect to skill, so movement verbality with respect to skill, the novice and the skill performance, we see the skilled performer express verbality differently. So low verbality and outcome. So what they're, they're achieving in terms of pistol shooting, they can hit the target, but how they vary the, the kinematics around the, the arm changes. So they can deal with perturbation is what we're suggesting here. And that's different to the novice. Less accurate in terms of outcome, but more rigid in terms of kinematics around the, the joints of interest. So we have this distinction between execution variability, which is how the joints are organizing themselves, how the movement pattern is changing, and endpoint variability, the outcome of the task. Consistency and outcome supported by variability in the kinematics below. And this goes back to Bernstein's idea here. We can see the, the blacksmith, the repetition without repetition, it's the changing patterns around the shoulder and the arm, but a very consistent outcome with that particular hammer. A recent publication, 2022, Cowan. This is a, a very nice scoping review that tries to set a framework for movement variability. It's somewhat complex because we have variability. Is it good? Is it bad? And what type of variability are we talking about? We've just seen there that the skilled performer has both low and high variability within the same task. So what the Karen framework tries to do and, and does a really good job of it is to say, well, strategic variability is you decide on maybe um, there's a selection of jumps that are going to achieve an outcome. So you want to you play basketball and you want to put the ball through the hoop. Well, all these different jumps would allow you to do that. Then there's the execution. You decide on one jump. So the execution variability is 
how I'm going to perform that, that specific jump you've chosen. And the outcome variability, well, this is the one that I guess matters most for the individual. What they have to do here is you either hit the target or you don't. So there's variability in outcome. Ideally, it's what you want. There's variability in performance, in execution, and there's also variability in the, the number of different options you could have selected to actually perform the jump. What we get with respect to then injury risk and variability is the idea of an optimal window. So we've talked about skill performance, outcome variability, execution variability, but what about in terms of um, injury risk and variability? The notion here is there could be an optimal window. So if we're moved in a very constrained manner, we've got maybe overly constrained invariant movement where the same tissue being stressed in the same way. We can also have the opposite though. Maybe we're so random in our movement, we're different every time that sometimes we're gonna hit um, patterns of movement that could be associated with particular types of injury. So the suggestion here is the nocturnal window, the sort of Goldilocks zone of variability, but whether that actually exists is still up for debate and what that might be for different tasks, again, is open. So this is where the sort of literature stands at this time around variability. Now at this point, we are moving into some different territory. We've set up the idea of what movement health is. We associate it to choice, choice in movement, both in how we move and what we do with it. We've identified then variability has a, uh, how, we, how we move different time to time. And this idea that there's an optimal window of variability where we're not moving overly constrained, but also we're not sort of random in our actions. Here, we're now going to introduce the third component of this conversation today, which is about dynamic tape. So, Beata, I'm going to sort of start then uh, giving you some sort of a, um, input here. Thanks, Nika. Yeah. Um, so, what is dynamic tape? I think um, it's, I mean, it's very well known uh, biomechanical type tape that I think uh, is, is quite well used or um, within chiropract the Chiropractic Association. Um, but, you know, as Lincoln's spoken about movement health, movement variability, retraining that movement, sometimes our clients need a bit of outside assistance and support in order to allow us to achieve those movement goals that we've set out for them. So what is dynamic tape? Well, it's a biomechanical tape that, when applied correctly, is able to inject a genuine mechanical force into the, into the kinetic chain. So, Lincoln, if we could go back to that picture of the dynamic splint, sorry. So, oh, yeah. part, of, part of the inspiration, thanks, part of the inspiration for the workings of dynamic tape, um, and, oh, by the way, I must say, obviously, it's, it's created and designed by Ryan Kendrick, who's a physiotherapist himself, um, and has done a lot of work in this field of movement. Um, and so part of the inspiration for the workings of dynamic tape um, came from the dynamic splint. So we've got a picture of it here. So this is a typical splint that you'd use, you know, post flexor tendon repair. And I'm not, I'm sure you're all familiar with the workings of dynamic splint, but what this allows is you'll see the elastic bands are there. So it al the splint allows the, the individual to actively extend their fingers and their wrist through range of movement. By the stretch, by stretching of the elastic bands, when they re relax, then the splint, the, the the elastic bands spring them back into full flexion. Now, obviously, post op of uh, flexor tendon repair, we want to try and protect the integrity of that repair as much as possible. But we also want to facilitate healing and allow healing to happen as well as possible. So, part of this is we're getting movement into the system, which can assist in you know, preventing scar tissue, it can assist in pain management as well, um, by improving you know, normal afferent inputs into the system. Um, but we're, we're protecting the, the repaired tissue. So that's very much where the, we're providing a force externally into the system and therefore changing kinematics that are, so we mentioned that earlier, kinematics and ki uh, kinetics and kinematics. We'll go into that a bit later. Um, so, Lincoln, if we can go on to the next slide. So, essentially, dynamic tape is a biomechanical tape that assists us in managing load, movement, and function. So, we'll we'll delve into these topics a, uh, a little bit more now. So, load. I, I love that Lincoln mentioned Goldilocks. Load is, is a bit like Goldilocks. Too much load 
can cause injury. So we look at, you know, we can have a stress fracture, we could get a fracture itself. Too little load can also affect, injury, uh, affect uh, pathology. So our load needs to be just right. Um, and if we can go on to the next slide, Lincoln. So load, load, act, uh, or how load acts on our movement system, our kinetic chain, and that therefore produces movement. So how we move influence force, influences forces on the kinetic chain as well, and, and the loads on the chain, and vice versa. The change in loads, change in forces can affect how we move. So dynamic tape injects a genuine mechanical force into the kinetic chain to provide an acceleration or deceleration effect at, the, at that joint, um, and that helps manage loads appropriately. Or it can alter movement patterns. So essentially it acts like an external muscle um, to do some of the work that the body would otherwise need to do intrinsically. And now in terms of function. So the correct application of dynamic tape can influence overall force generation requirements. It can influence force generation capacity. So by changing the position to influence length tension ratio, we could possibly reduce pain um, by affecting that and thereby affecting pain inhibition. Um, and it can also influence force transfer efficiency. So that can be improved by the force closure that can be provided by the tape, depending on how you um, apply it. Um, and that can change position of the joint as well as the length of the lever arms. So going on to kinetics and kinematics, um, we, I briefly touched on this now. So a lot, of, a lot of the research or the studies that we look at actually look at kinematics. So kinematics is the movement that results from forces that are applied onto the kinetic chain. Kinetics takes into consideration the, the forces that are applied onto, onto the body. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So people will often ask what, you know, the tape is applied to the skin. So how can that have an effect on the mechanics um, of, the, of the kinetic chain? So, but in fact, we're looking at the kinetics. So if we look at this, these two pictures here, the ki kinematics are very similar. We're in a neutral ankle position, but the kinetics are very different. So on the left-hand side, there's very little force acting on that, on, on the ankle joint. On the right-hand side, there's a lot more force acting on it. Um, so by introducing a force that crosses the joint when we apply the tape, remember so that's, that's imperative is that the tape needs to be applied across the joint in order to um, exert a, a force um, onto the system. So we introduce a force that crosses the joint, but then that can then change the movement at said joint, and in doing so, reduce the required work. I'll just jump in because we've lost BT, but... Here we go. We've got it back? Okay, perfect. We've got you back. Sorry, man. I lost, I lost everything. <laughs> no worries. We've so, got you back. <laughs> perfect. Um, that, that's what happens in South Africa, guys. Um, so, we, if, yeah, I'll just quickly go. I don't, I'm not sure where, where I got lost there. But um, so if we, if we look at kinetics, so uh, as I said, um, people will often ask, you know, how can, how can a tape, which is applied to the skin, um, have an effect on the mechanics of the, of the kinetic chain? And so, but in fact, what we, we're not necessarily looking at the, at the kinematics, we're looking at the kinetics. So if we can apply, if we can change, modify the load, modify the forces acting on a specific joint, that can then potentially change the kinematics down the line. So we're, we're looking at introducing a force that crosses the joint, that can then change the movement at said joint, and in doing so reduce the required workload of the structure that would usually create that force. So if we're thinking of an, an Achilles tendinopathy, if we're wanting to take a bit of load off of that Achilles tendon, we can apply tape in a manner that can do that. So we've got a, a short video here that I'll ask LinkedIn to play. I'm going to stop it a bit early, but I'll tell you when. And this is Ryan just explaining the force contribution. Yeah, I was thinking we've got a little bit of Ryan's contribution here, haven't we? So let's, uh, let's mm. see how that goes. Okay. 
Now, oh, well, could you put the volume up a bit there, Lincoln? Oh, we don't seem to be hearing it on our side, but it's that's fine. I'll um, I'll talk over it. You can keep playing it. Um, so basically, what Ryan's looking at here is he's got a force monitor there. So hopefully you'll be able to see that on your screens a little bit um, clearer. Um, I can't now remember the exact forces that go through there. Um, but what he's looking at, he's looking at the resting position of the foot. So he's measuring that as I think it's 117. So I'm a, on a bit of a small screen here. And then he's looking at the force required to move that joint through space. So that's a force, force um, uh, measurement tool. And um, so what he's going to do here is he's going to just move that ankle into further dorsiflexion. Let's see. Brian likes to talk. <laughs> We're talking about efficiency of movement here, Ryan. Be efficient with your words. <laughs> All right, it should be moving. Okay. Right, so oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. So what we're looking at there is without any tape, there's an, a, a certain amount of force. I think from memory, it's about four or five kilograms of force or newtons of force. All right. And so that's taking it to a certain dorsiflexion degree. And then he's looking at just the, you know, at speed in outer range, one gets about two, two kilograms of force or two newtons of force. Now we've applied tape onto over the ankle and the way of applying that would be, you're applied in a shortened position. So the ankle is, is placed in um, plant flexion and the tape is applied. Now we're looking at the force that's required to move that joint through space. So as you can all see there from the force um, measurement, that a lot more force is required to move that joint into that same range um, as earlier. When we do it even faster, the force required is, is that much more. All right. So it just shows that that the application of the tape, the correct application of the tape across the joint can, can inject a genuine force into, into the kinetic chain. All right, thanks, Lincoln. So now if we, if we move on to the clinical opportunities, so the next slide will be, yeah, clinical opportunities. So where, where can we use this? So we're, as clinicians, we're always managing load. That is what we do. Um, we sometimes have too much, someone who's come in and they've, they've got an injury because they've had too much load through a certain area, or, uh, and we will use load in order to manage um, dysfunctions, movement dysfunctions. So if we can go to the next slide here, Lincoln. So tape, where might it be indicated? during an unaccustomed load. So if we get someone who, you know, suddenly decides, all their mates decide, right, we're going to run, you know, the marathon, and he's done no training, you, you could probably make it. The head's a, the head's a powerful, powerful being. Um, but the tissue structures might not. Then they won't be able to manage that unaccustomed load. We'll get overload injuries. We could use it then where we want to actually, because we're ex exerting an external force onto the kinetic chain, we can actually provide a bit of offload to those intrinsic structures. Through transition phases, let's say we're taking our, our client through an ACL um, rehabilitation and we're now moving into maybe change in direction um, impact. We can use, use the tape to support those structures to give a bit of, of input as well. Okay, and then acute overload, when we've just done too much, it might be that, you know, you, your weekend warrior plays tennis twice a week and all of a sudden there's, you know, the national tournament for masters and now there's five days worth of tennis playing. Um, we can use the tape to assist in managing that load whilst 
allowing our patient to continue playing. And then permit early functional loading to end reducing compensation. So I find this particularly uh, um, helpful in shoulders. So when we wanting to try and um, re-educate those synergistic, um, those syn muscle synergies acting on the shoulder girdle by using the tape to offload um, the to offload that that shoulder joint, that glenohumeral joint, we can um, we can allow them to activate their muscles. Again, it also allows to a certain extent pain relief because we are offloading that um, that angry tissue, and that can also thereby affect your pain inhibition. Um, permit optimal tissue healing, and then also technique correction. So if we're if we're trying to correct a technique. Um, or improve a technique, we can use that um, as well. And that's me. Thanks, Beata. Um, so we've had um, an outline in intersection and an overview there of, sort of the dynamic tape, um, the product, the tape itself, but also its workings, and uh, hopefully also seeing some of its um, uh, implications for uh, clinical utilization. Here we start to then circle back around um, so we start to bring about movement health into the conversation and also relating this now to movement variability or variability. Do we have variability in how we move would be, um, I guess, one of the, the sort of questions we're asking. And this is using the, the current movement science um, concepts. And alongside this, we're going to see how dynamic tape can be integrated. OK. So in an optimal state, imagine there was such a thing as an optimal state of movement health. And clearly that is a utopian place to be. <laughs> that no matter who we are, we're never going to be at this completely perfect state of movement health. There's no such thing. That would be having every movement choice available to us. So no matter what you wanted to do, you could do it and you could do it in any particular way you choose. However, we're on a continuum moving away from that optimal state towards a place where maybe we don't have any options left in, in terms of achieving a movement outcome. So our movement could become more and more invariant, invariant with behavior. So when we're asked to prevent something, maybe we cannot prevent that thing happening. It happens, we can't stop it. We have lost choice in our movement. So in the 2020 paper, we put forth this idea of something called lost movement choice. And alongside that was this hypothesis that what we're finding with testing movement in this way was reduced variability. So some sort of qualitative approach to identifying variability within a clinical setting, which we believe to be particularly important if variability has an association to clinical presentations, which again, there's some literature suggests that is the case. So how do we actually go about testing movement? Where is our focus? We've said that we're interested in choice, but it's a very broad concept that. What does that mean in terms of application? We've identified there's maybe numerous factors that can influence and change our movement within the individual. We've, we've identified some here. So under that construct of movement, we are looking at movement coordination strategies. And to break those that down further, we're either looking at in-segmental coordination, so how one segment moves compared to another segment, or we're looking at how muscles recruit, the efficiency of muscle recruitment. And again, that we're inferring that from lots of different observations, characteristics of how people move. Ultimately, though, we're looking for loss of choice in movement, which would represent this compromised movement health. We can classify this somewhat further. So we can put a framework in place. So within the framework that exists within kinetic control, which is a key component of Khmer Moon science, we could be looking at the, the site and direction of loss of movement choice. We perform cognitive movement control tests, which we see identified here, to identify the, the movements that people cannot stop using. When asked, they can't stop doing it. We can also look at muscle synergy efficiency. So this is me turning this into a slideshow and there's a muscle synergy test. So look at the, the recruitment efficiency of a muscle during a movement such as this. We can also look at the recruitment efficiency of muscles that possess a translation control role. So when we are not looking at uh, 
uh, rotations, joint rotations, but translations. Muscles can have a role in this. And we can look at the efficiency of those through these types of tests. We also want to know about restrictions. How are restrictions influencing the outcome of these tests? It could be there's a myofascial restriction. It could be there's an articular restriction that's, again, influencing how people move. And the influence on those tests means they may fail what they may, have, may not have failed if they didn't have that restriction. More specific insight on one type of testing then. So a cognitive movement control test. Here we see there's an individual that needs to uh, adopt a certain position in the pelvis. We ask them to find a mid position in the pelvis and then aim to maintain that alignment as they achieve a mandatory benchmark at another region. For example, in this test, a certain amount of knee flexion is achieved whilst trying to prevent the pelvis uh, anteriorly rotating, going to a pelvic tilt anteriorly. Now, it's not saying that everybody should um, um, keep their pelvis in neutral all the time. It's not that at all. We put the pelvis in neutral so it has a chance to move somewhere. As in, we want to know which way it goes. If they're already in an anterior pelvic tilt, the suggestion would be they couldn't go any further into this. Therefore, we would not see them fail the test because they've already failed it in a way. So we need to have them in a center, center position so the pelvis has a chance to move. In this particular question then, we'll say, can you prevent it going into an anterior pelvic tilt whilst they achieve the mandatory benchmark? So the, the benchmark is non-negotiable. And we want to see if they possess choice in this action and again, it's not that this is the perfect way to, to move. It's saying, do you have the ability? Do you have the choice in how you move? Yes or no. If they consistently fail the test, it suggests that they do not have choice in this. So what? And what's the relationship with variability? So in a 2022 publication, what we wanted to do is to compare those that passed and failed this test and to look at the variability and performance between the two groups. And when we looked at the, um, the ability to control the pelvis and looked at the relative motion, the pelvis against the knee, we saw that those that failed the test displayed lower variability. So trial to trial, there's reduced variability for those failing the test. So this was the first bit of support really for the idea of the loss of movement choice hypothesis. If you cannot um, prevent a, a movement happening, consistently, you're displaying reduced variability. And the notion here is that reduced variability is associated with overuse risk and clinical presentations. The same tissue has been stressed in the same way. So that was the first little bit of insight we got that maybe we could be on something here. In addition to performing that test, in addition to hitting the benchmark and maybe preventing that uh, pelvis going and anterior pelvic tilt, Within our testing process, you'd get the first, you'd get the first tick, as it were. But there are other, there's other criteria you need to meet. So you can make the shape, so you can perform the actual movement, but is there a mismatch between how hard you're trying to do this and the task intensity? So this is a body weight movement. And really, that probably should not be turned into a fatiguing effort or associated to characteristics of movement that look fatiguing. So to achieve the, the second tick, we need to meet these criteria. Ultimately, that the, the task being performed is met with an appropriate amount of effort. So it should look easy and feel easy because we believe this is a so-called easy in terms of loading, non-fatiguing, slow motor unit dominant type task. And these other ratings available. It might be you can't achieve the, the test task anyway so you get a cross cross. So there's a, a rating in terms of um, both achievement of the, um, the benchmark and not going into the anterior pelvic tilt in this test, but also in terms of how difficult that was. And this is where you get your, your tick, tick or cross cross ratings, for example. So we have movement health, the possession of choice in movement. We have movement variability distinctions in how we move trial to trial, and then this notion that these types of tests could inform on movement variability. 
and movement variability have been associated to clinical presentations through this overuse of tissues. And then we've sort of mentioned also, we've talked about dynamic tape and its ability to change influence movement and also affect loading. So then we start to bring this all together in terms of a case study. Okay, so the case. Now, within the original slideshow, we work backwards here from where we are now to right back at school for this particular individual. So what I'm gonna do now is, again, introduce uh, Beata's um, content into this. So Beata, um, just give us a little bit more insight in terms of our patient here. Perfect. Well, if we, if I'm going to ask you guys to follow me from the right hand side of the slides and, and I'll take you through to the left. So this was one of my clients that came to see me last year, a um, 36 year old female. She um, is actually a physio, but not currently practicing as a physio. So uh, her, she's a mom of two of two small children and so very active. And she came to me with symptoms into her left leg. So quite neural symptoms into her left leg. Um, she also uh, struggled with right lateral knee pain, um, left lower back pain, and then left shoulder pain, and um, af after an event, left Achilles pain. So the idea, um, or, or she came to me about six weeks out from um, completing her first half uh, Ironman, so a triathlon, um, which involves a Oh, now I'm going to be tested. Hey, um, I think it's a 1.9 K swim. Um, it's a 90 kilometer cycle and then a half marathon run um, to finish it off. And she's also a keen trail runner. So this patient came to me. Um, so so that, 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 those are the sister symptoms that she came to me with. And that's, that's a bit of who she is. Otherwise, fit and healthy. If we go towards 2016, we, look, we, we see that um, to note from her medical history is that she underwent a left hip arthroscopy uh, in 2016. Uh, she had a label repair, a glute repair, and then um, and, and complications of that in, included a femoral nerve injury. So she actually had no quad activation for the first few days. Prior to that, in 2010, she um, had, a, had had a history of left lateral knee pain as well as low back pain. Um, an MRI was done at the time, which identified the um, the uh, dysfunction in the in the hip joint, um, but a conservative treatment plan was followed. And then, if we go back even further, at a high school level, she at, at high school she was a national um, level 400 meter hurdler, and to to note was that her right leg was her lead leg, and her left leg obviously then her trailing leg leg. Um, she also took part um, at a fairly high level in at, uh, in netball as well as ballet. Okay, so all I'm going to add into that is um, we've got this sort of evolution of the individual here with respect to we've got sort of um, presentations, same symptoms, but also we've got a sporting activity where there's um, a certain amount of consistency in terms of being a, a hurdler. There's a certain performance. We're looking for the execution of, the, of that, that hurdle each time. Um, there's ideas about that being very consistent, so maybe low verbality in the performance. And also then we've got um, a task like a, a challenge like an Ironman and, and trail running, which again, we've got sort of lots of repetitive movement going on. So it's just sort of adding in the verbality uh, association to what they've been doing as, a, as, a, as an athlete, as an individual who's performing these, mm -hmm. these different activities. So, okay. Absolutely. Right. So here, so so this basically is a is a summary. As, as Lincoln has spoken about those those three areas, and then we're wanting to assess movement. So this is just putting our, our assessment into into perspective here. So our symptoms on on the left at the bottom were our neural symptoms into the left leg, the right lateral knee pain, left lower back pain, left shoulder pain, and then left Achilles pain. Her neurodynamics were also compromised, so she has a sensitized straight leg raise on the left more so than the right. Um, when testing, so you know, going through the details of, of our um, cognitive movement coordination tests um, is is, time, is is another another webinar's topic. But what we found when looking at coordination efficiency was a lost movement choice uh, um, of lumbar pelvic extension and rotation lost movement choice of hip right internal rotation and flexion and then lost movement choice of scapular downward rotation 
We then assessed the muscle synergies and found um, that bilateral she scored a tick cross for lateral rotator global stabilizers. Um, on the left side, she was surprisingly very good with her hip extensor um, global stabilizers, but on the right side, scored a tick cross. Um, serratus anterior muscle synergist was, um, was bilaterally double cross, so she wasn't able to reach that benchmark. Um, and then her lower trapezius uh, on the left side, was she wasn't able to reach the benchmark, but on the right side, she reached the benchmark, but wasn't able to do it comfortably or easily. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, we've sort of, we've shifted tack. So we've put the, for the individual, they've got the, the symptoms, their neurodynamics in terms of testing for that as well, listed underneath the, the constraints of the individual. And our focus has shifted to the outcome now being on the, the testing results. So as we just described from Biata there in terms of the cognitive movement control test, the bilateral squat we saw earlier on, and then the muscle synergy testing. We've then put that in this particular framework. So here we go. So this clinical, so put it, putting it into a framework here, it really just helps us as clinicians focus our, our management. And um, so in the middle there, we've got our site and direction. So obviously with this, with this um, patient, there's uh, quite a substantial history. So therefore, um, it, it makes it a little bit more complicated in terms of the number of site and directions of lost movement choice. So we've got We've put it out here quite simply in the lumbar pelvic region, um, extension and rotation, as we said earlier, the hip right internal rotation and flexion, and then the scapular downward rotation. So that in itself will give me as the clinician a guideline as to where I'm going to start my retraining of movement. Um, we then on the left hand side will see that we tested the global stabilizer role synergists and we've scored that over there. And then in terms of your um, myofascial restrictions, our straight leg raise. Um, uh, with, was restricted in terms of our neurodynamics and then also articular restriction. We've got our thoracic extension and rotation to the left that was restricted. So this, um, having this in, in one's clinical notes can really help one um, identify what needs to be worked on. Um, I find it a very efficient way of doing it. There's, there's, we're, not, we're not wasting time treating something that's not, that might be a red herring. Um, and then it also helps us when we come back to our patient to reassess and then to know where we are in our process of retraining. So at this point then, we've, we've performed um, a whole load of testing. So we've um, differentiated the testing into looking at um, uh, synergy efficiency, muscle synergy efficiency, um, inferring that from um, how people move, can they, ach they achieve these particular requirements of testing? We've done that also for the coordination and efficiency. Can they move one region whilst trying to prevent or control or prevent observable movement in another region? But we're also looking at um, the presence of restriction and classifying that based on whether it's myofascial or articular. And then this feeds into where it all goes next. It's great to know this stuff, I guess, that, well, we need to fix this, but then how do we address it? So that then takes into, I guess, the retraining component, which is under the heading of restoring choice. So... How do we start to um, address what we found in testing? So if this is our test that we performed, well, we've got then a site of pelvis, we've got a direction of anterior pelvic tilt, and that, um, that mismatch between the, the challenge of the task and the effort um, given to it, we would describe as a low threshold problem because this is a low threshold task low motor unit dominant non-fatiguing ideally but still the individual fails this so what are the retraining guidelines what's the retraining look like well for this it would be the region that you're trying to um, prevent observable movement at make sure that is the occurring as in we're not going to an anterior pelvic tilt as we move below so we can move into uh, knee flexion knee extension for example and we can also move above so we might um, use thoracic extension without going to anterior pelvic tilt. So move above in the same direction, move below in the same direction, or move the same site, so move the pelvis, but in a different direction. Now that might be involved some sort of rotation of the pelvis without them going into a more anteriorly tilted pelvis. So there's three different um, uh, design ideas there, exercise design ideas, within that one approach, move above, move below, or the same site, different direction. 
But to make sure we stay low threshold, to make sure it stays at the appropriate challenge, the appropriate intensity, the appropriate recruitment threshold, we want to make sure we've got two minutes of what we want to describe as time under attention. So you may have come across the term time under attention used within strength training literature. Here, the challenge needs to be cognitive. It needs to engage them so that they've got that thousand yard stare. You can see that they're having to concentrate on the, the motion being performed, that the region moving is, but the region that's not moving is not. So time under attention is maybe one way to describe that particular type of challenge. And here we do also give high threshold. It could be that they failed high threshold tests, which do exist, and they need to be performing um, some sort of uh, intervention that's going to bring about change in strength and hypertrophy. And we're just sort of saying here, 60 to 90 seconds, perhaps, of a control repetition maximum. They're still working in with the constraints of they can perform this action as required. Multiple sets, multiple rest periods would be needed for that, just like you would use in strength training. So you can differentiate between low and high threshold, but you can still use that same model of exercise design that we see here with those three circles. And ultimately what we're trying to do, well, we're trying to move this person back along towards the left. Those movement choices lost that we've identified within testing are restored. So restoring choices, restoring them towards a more optimal state of movement health. We can't ever get to the full, um, the full 100% version of that, but we're trying to move them left along that continuum is the idea. So here now we move back into the case study that was that, um, with Beata and what we actually did. And also we see some dynamic tape components here too. Yeah, so basically, um if we look at the retraining, so we addressed um, all of all of those areas. So in terms of her uh, scapula, we retrained the upward rotation. But in order to you know assist in that retraining, um, we we use dynamic tape. Um, often pain can affect the well, not often, always pain will affect the way we move. And if we can make that area more comfortable, then we can often facilitate our retraining. And um, so we use dynamic tape to. Uh, elevate the shoulder um, and that therefore then also yeah made it a little bit more easier to get the retraining of serratus anterior and lower trap. In terms of her right into uh, uh, her hip flexion and internal rotation in order to retrain that we required also a bit of control or control work at the knee and in order to do that we used dynamic tape to facilitate a medial glide of the patella which then facilitated the retraining of the of the hip um, and then if we look at her sorry i'm just going to change this quickly my view here and um, oopsie no where are we going oh sorry yeah that's on my screen guys um and then um in and, and in terms of her her knee she also had that right knee pain as right lateral knee pain so, so that assisted that medial glide of the patella assisted with that as well um, and then when we, when we were during our treatment, um, as we know, um, our, our clients often don't necessarily always follow exactly what, what we'd like. Um, and so uh, this particular patient had done quite a hard cycle and had therefore flared up her lower back. Um, here I use dynamic tape in a symptomatic way to try and reduce that flare up into her, into, uh, of her lower back. And that really helped her positioning on the bike. And then as well as, as a flare-up of her back, she struggled with a flare-up of the Achilles. I personally think a lot of that neurodynamics would, it affect, would have affected that. Um, and here again, we use dynamic tape to help manage the load through that Achilles tendon and so that we could um, reduce her symptoms of pain, but also allow her to continue training. So the use of dynamic tape was alongside the, the sight and direction component. And because you knew the mm -hmm. sight and directions, you could implement dynamic tape in a, in a very directed way. Because yeah, I find that, that, yeah. Mm, yeah, I find that the Chimera Movement Science concept of assessing cognitive uh, coordination efficiency really forms the groundwork on which the clinician can then um, use dynamic tape and, and the application of, of the dynamic tape. Okay, I think we're sort of getting to now um, 
starting to get some sort of kind of uh, outcomes, conclusions with respect to the sort of presentation. So thank everybody for sort of bearing with us with a few sort of technical issues along the way. Hopefully we can uh, get to the end of this without there being any more. Um, so the other overarching concept has been movement health and this focus on movement, our perception, our uh, version of what movement health is with this focus on choice in what we do with it, but also how we use our movement system. So how we might perform any given task, the, the cognitive movement control test, ask a specific question about how you perform an action, how you can execute a task. And when you consistently cannot meet the criteria, it suggests that you've started to lose choice in movement. And we would associate that also with reduced variability in movement and harking back to those ideas about how that are related to overuse of tissues. We've also seen that how dynamic tape can support um, unloading of structures and how that can be also supported by the site and direction testing through the tests we've been describing. And this idea that sort of that loss of choice is this idea of compromised movement health. So it seems I've sort of moved into the sort of sum, summing up stage already. Um, and it's probably a good place to start to leave this would be where the, the patient, or no, I think no longer maybe a patient, as we can see here, was in 2022 in terms of November. Um, so, Beata, what can you give us about this picture? Well, this this was basically one of her goals was to um, take part in a in a multi day trail race. Um, the the initial goal was the half Ironman that she completed really well, and then and then as 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 she improved, her goal changed to this multi day trail race. Um, and it's a four day stage race in the mountains, and she came top ten. So by, you know, by improving her movement choices, she really exceeded her, her own expectations of performance. And we were speaking the other day, maybe sort of what's next for this, uh, for this client, I guess. Um, and we're sort of having this conversation about how they came in as a patient, but now clearly we're going somewhere else. So the idea mm. is sort of we're moving into sort of quality of life and performance and certainly moving yeah. away a long way from, from that injury component of this. So, um, positive outcomes um and hopefully um if issues did come about we, we she's got a good structure to come back to in terms Absolutely. of that retraining yeah okay so i think apart from sort of one of those types of slides which shows oh all those mm -hmm. uh, all those references in there um so happy reading um i guess we're sort of then moving into any, any sort of questions so um megan hello Hi, I will jump back in now. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Lincoln and Beate, for a fantastic session and for giving up your time to come and speak to us all today. Um, if you do have any questions for everybody who's watching, I know there's um, quite a number of people watching live. Um, even if you are catching the replay, feel free to write your questions in because we are um, obviously very close collaborators and very close <coughs> partners with both Dynamic Tape and the Camara Movement Science. Um, so we're more than happy to help with answering your questions afterwards. Uh, feel free to leave them in the comments now. I noticed that um, we don't have any questions right now. Um, but thank you so much, both of you, for your time. And um, as I mentioned, so this replay will be available on Facebook. You can also watch it. We'll be embedding, embedding it within the FIX uh, website permanently within the Dynamic Tech sponsor page. We also have Chimera Movement Science is um, currently giving away um, a Kinetic Control Movement Therapist Foundation module. So if you jump over to the FIX website, we have that partnership running with them too. There's a win button at the top of our menu bar. So lots of fantastic, fantastic um, partnerships happening right now and going on. And um, we're really looking forward to continuing into 2023 um, closely partnering with you. Megan, that's excellent. What I'll, what I'll do, I think, as well is, um, I think given uh, we, we had an interesting version of the presentation there and, and actually, um, <laughs> Hopefully it was still really useful, but what I'll do, and hopefully Beata, you're happy with this as well, we'll sort of record a, um, a full version um, as, a, as we originally intended. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll get you a link to that as well. So if that's okay, Megan, we'll send you that link over. Perfect, and then I'll do some magic editing tomorrow. Um, tomorrow <laughs> yeah. I'm telling my time to um, make it a bit shorter with some of the technical at the start. Um, but yeah, no, thank beautiful. you so much. No, thank you. Okay, well, thanks ever so much, and, uh, and catch you later. Have a great night, everybody, or day, or morning, or wherever you're tuning in from, and we'll catch you soon.